right, folks. Hi. Bet you weren't expecting me. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Paper Cuts, everybody. I'm Glacier Nestor. Apparently, the request... I did some asking around. And the request line does work. I don't know if it'll actually ring for me. But, supposedly, the request line number is... Let me pull it up here. The Stinger request line is 3336217. <laughs> now take that with a grain of salt, as last time I gave out a phone number on the air, <laughs> it led to the uh, music director's switchboard. So please do take that with a grain of salt. That may be incorrect but if one of you gives it a shot please uh i don't know at me on twitter i guess <laughs> would be the easiest way to get a hold of me while i'm in the booth yeah uh but aside from all that self-promotion and all that whatnot uh we're here to read books oh one more thing before i start i'm kind of getting over a cold if you can't tell so the show's gonna be a little shorter today probably an hour and a half maybe two hours We'll see how well my voice holds up. But, regardless of all that... <clears throat> Sorry, if I'm randomly quiet during the uh, recording, it's because I'm leaning away from the microphone to cough so you guys don't get gross coughing sounds over the air. <laughs> so the long and short is, we're reading today. It's gonna be a little shorter. <laughs> We're going to start with Spawn of the Stars by Charles Williard Diffin. When Cyrus R. Thuston bought himself a single-motored Stoughton job, he was looking for new thrills. Flying around the East Coast had lost its zest. He wanted to join that jaunty group who spoke so easily of hopping off for Los Angeles. And what Cyrus Thurston wanted, he usually obtained... But if that young millionaire sportsman had been told that on his first flight this blocky, bullet-like ship was to pitch him headlong into the exact center of this wildest, strangest war this earth had ever seen, well, it's still probable that the Stolten Company wouldn't have lost a sail. They were roaring through the starlit, calm night, 3,000 feet above a sage-sprinkled desert, when the trip ended. Slim Riley had the stick when the first blast of hot oil ripped slashing the re across the pilot's window. There goes your old trip, he yelled. Why do they try putting engines in these ships? He jammed over the throttle and, with motor idling, swept down toward the endless miles of moonlit waste. Wind? They'd been boring into it. Through the open window, he spotted a likely stretch of ground. Setting down the ship on a nice piece of Arizona desert was a mere detail for Slim. Let off a flare, he ordered, when I give the word. The white glare of it faded the stars as he sidestepped, then straightened out on his hand-picked field. The plane rolled down a clear space and stopped. The bright glare persisted while he stared curiously from the quiet cabin. Cutting the motor, he opened both windows and then grabbed Thurston by the shoulder. It's a curious thing, that, he said, unsteadily. He'd pointed straight ahead. The flare died, but the bright stars of the desert country still shone on a glistening, shining bulb. It was some 200 feet away. The lower part was lost in shadow, but its upper surfaces shone rounded and silvery like a giant bubble. It towered in the air, scores of feet above, uh, above the chaparral beside it. There was a round spot of black on its side, which looked absurdly like a door. Oh my, we appear to have found a unidentified flying object. <laughs> I love these stories. <clears throat> I saw... I, I saw something moving, said Thurston slowly. On the ground I saw... Oh, good heavens, Slim, it isn't real. Slim Riley made no reply. His eyes were riveted to an undulating, ghastly something that oozed and crawled in the pale light not far from the bulb. His hand was reaching, reaching... It found what he sought. He leaned toward the window. In his hand was the very pistol for discharging the flares. He aimed forward and up. The second flare hung close before it settled on the sandy floor. Its blinding whiteness made the more loath 
made the more loathsome the sickening yellow of the flabby flowing thing that writhed fanatic frantically in the glare it was formless shapeless a heaving mound of nauseous matter yet even in its agonized writhing distortions they sensed the beating pulsations that marked it a living thing there were unending ripplings crossing and recrossing through the convolutions to thurston there was suddenly a sickening likeness the thing was a brain from a gigantic skull it was naked and it was suffering <coughs> huh. hmm. jeez you guys still could hear that <laughs> even without me being very close up to the mic the thing poured itself across the sand before the staring gaze of, gaze of speechless men and extrasens appeared a thick bulb on the mass that protruded itself into a tentacle. At the end, there grew instantly a hooked hand. It reached for the black opening in the great shell, found it, and the whole loathsome shapelessness poured itself up and through the hole. Only at last was it still. In the dark opening, the last slippery mass held quiet for endless seconds. It formed as they watched to a head, frightful and menacing. Eyes appeared in the head, eyes flat and round and black, save for a cross slit in each. Eyes that stared horribly and unchangingly into theirs. Below them a gaping mouth opened and closed. The head melted and it was gone. And with its going came a rushing roar of sound. From under the metallic mass shrieked a vaporous cloud. It drove at them, a swirling blast of snow and sand. Some buried memory of gas attacks woke Riley from his stupor, and he slammed shut the windows an instant before the cloud struck, but not before they had seen, in the moonlight, a gleaming, gigantic, elongated bulb rise swiftly, screamingly, into the upper air. The blast tore at their plane, and in the cold in their tight compartment was like the cold of outer space. The men stared, speechless, panting. Their breath froze in that frigid room into steam clouds. It... It... Thurston gasped and slumped helpless upon the floor. It was an hour before they dared open the door of their cabin. An hour of biting, numbing cold. Zero on a warm summer night in the desert. Snow in the hurricane that had struck them. "'Twas the blast from the thing," guessed the pilot. "'Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. "'Though I never did see an engine with an exhaust like that. <clears throat> "'He was pounding himself with his arms to force up the chilled circulation. "'But... but the beast, the... the, the thing!' exclaimed Thurston. "'It's monstrous, indecent, it thought. "'There was no question of that.' But it had no... It had no body. It was horrible. It was just... Just a raw, naked, thinking protoplasm. It was here that he flung open the door. They sniffed cautiously the air, and it was warm again. Clean. Save for a hint of some nauseous order, odor. They walked forward, and Riley carried a flash. The odor grew to a stench as they came where the great mass had lain. On the ground was a fleshy mound. There were bones showing, and horns on a skull. Riley held the light close to show the body of a steer, a body of raw, bleeding meat. Half of it had been absorbed. A thing, said Riley, and paused vainly for adequate words. The, th the thing was eating like a jellyfish it was. Exactly, Thurston agreed. He pointed about, and there were some other heaps scattered among the low sage. Smothered, guessed Thurston, with that frozen exhaust. Then the filthy thing landed and came out to eat. Hold the light for me. I'm going to go fix that busted oil line, and I'm going to do it right now. Maybe the creature's still hungry. They sat in their room. About them was the luxury of a modern hotel. Cyrus Thurston stared vacantly at the breakfast he was forgetting to eat. He wiped his hands mechanically on a snowy napkin, and he looked from the window. 
There were palm trees in the park and autos in a ceaseless stream. And people, sane, sober people, living in a sane world. Newsboys were shouting and the life of the city was flowing. Riley. Thurston turned to the man across the table. His voice was curiously toneless and his face haggard. Riley, I haven't slept for three nights. Neither of you. We've got to get this thing straight. We didn't both become absolute maniacs at the same instant, but... It was... It was not there. It was never there. Not that. He was lost in unpleasant recollections. There are other records of hallucinations. Hallucinations? How? said Slim Riley. He was looking at a Los Angeles newspaper. He passed one hand wearily across his eyes, but his face was happier than it had been in days. We didn't imagine it. We're not crazy. It's real. Would you read this now? He passed the paper across to Thurston, and the headlines were startling. Pilot killed by mysterious airship. Silvery bubble hangs over New York, downs army plane in a burst of flame, and vanishes at terrific speed. It's our little friend, said Thurston. And on his face, too, the lines were vanishing. To find this horror reality was positive relief. Here's the same cloud of vapor, drifted slowly across the city, the accounts say, blowing this stuff like steam from underneath. Airplanes investigated. An army plane drove into the vapor. Terrific explosion. Plane down in flames. Others wrecked. The machine ascended with the meteor speed, trailing blue flame. Come on, boy. Where's that old bus? Thought I never wanted to fly a plane again, and now I don't want to do anything but... Where to? Slim inquired. Headquarters. Thurston told him. Washington. Let's go. From Los Angeles to Washington isn't far, as the plane flies anyway. There was a stop or two for gasoline, but it was only a day later that they were seated in the war office. Thurston's card had gained immediate admi admittance. Got the lowdown, he'd written on the back of his card, on the mystery airship. What you've told me is incredible, the secretary was saying, or it would be if General Lozier here would, had not reported personally on the occurrence at New York. But the monster, the thing you've described, I didn't know you as... If I didn't know you as I do, I'd have you locked up. It's it's true, said Thurston simply. It's it's damnable, but it's true. Now, what does that mean? Heaven knows, was the response. That's where it came from, out of the heavens. Not what we saw, Slim Riley broke in. That thing came straight out of hell. And in his voice was no suggestion of levity. You left Los Angeles early yesterday. Have you seen the papers? Thurston shook his head. They're back, said the secretary. Reported over London, Paris, the West Coast. Even China's seen them. Shanghai cabled an hour ago. Th them? How many are there? Nobody knows. There were five seen at one time. There are more, unless the same ones go around the world in a matter of minutes. Thurston remembered that whirlwind of vapor and a vanishing speck in the Arizona sky. Well, they could. They're faster than anything on Earth. Though I'm not sure what drives them, that gas, steam, whatever it is. Hydrogen. <clears throat> Hydrogen, stated General Lozier. I saw the New York show when poor Davis got his. He flew into the exhaust. It went off like a million bombs. Characteristic hydrogen flame trailed the darn thing up and out of sight. A tail of blue fire. And... And cold? Stated Thurston. Hot as a Bunsen burner, the general contradicted. Davis's plane almost melted. Before it ignited, said the other, he told of the cold in their plane. Huh? The general spoke explosively. That's expansion. That's a tip on their motive power. Expansion of gas. That accounts for the cold in the vapor. Suddenly expanded, it would be intensely cold. The moisture of the air would condense and freeze. But how would they carry it, or... He frowned for a moment, brows drawn over deep-set gray eyes. Or generate it. But that's crazy, that's impossible. So it is, so is the whole matter, 
the secretary reminded him. With the information Mr. Thurston and Mr. Riley have given us, the whole affair is beyond, den beyond any gauge our past experience might supply. We start from the impossible and go... Where? What is to be done? With your permission, sir, a number of things could be done. It'd be interesting to see what, an, what a squadron of planes might accomplish diving on them from above, or anti-aircraft fire, for that matter. No, said the Secretary of War. Not yet. They've looked us over, but they haven't attacked. For the present, we do not know what they are. All of us have our suspicions, thoughts of interplanetary travel, thoughts too wild for serious utterance, but we know nothing. Say nothing to the papers of what you've told me, he directed Thurston. Heaven knows their surmises are wild enough now. And for you, General, in the event of any hostile move, you resist. Your order was anticipated, sir. The General permitted himself a slight smile. The Air Force is ready. Of course, the Secretary of War nodded. Meet me here tonight, nine o'clock. He included Thurston and Riley in the command. We need to think. To think. And perhaps their mission is friendly. <laughs> friendly? The two flyers exchanged glances as they went to the door. And each knew what the other was seeing. A vicious, ocherous mat. Ocherous? How do you... Am I saying that right? Hold on. <laughs> Let me pull up the dictionary here. <clears throat> oh, ocher. Ochre. No, ochreous mass. There we go. As in, like, the pigment ochre. Ochreous mass that formed into a head where eyes devilish in their hate stared coldly into theirs. Think. We need to think, repeated Thurston later. A creature that... A creature that's just one big hideous brain that can think an arm into existence. Think of a head where it wishes. What does a thing like that think of? What beastly thoughts could that, that, that thing conceive? If I got the sights of a Lewis gun on it, said Riley vindictively, I'd make it think. And my guess is that's all you'd accomplish, Thurston told him. I'm forming a few theories about our visitors, and one of them is it would be quite impossible to find a vital spot in that big, homogenous mass. The pilot dispensed with theories. He was a more literal mind. Where on earth did they come from, you suppose, Mr. Thurston? Huh. <clears throat> <coughs> They were walking to their hotel. Thurston raised his eyes to the summer heavens, where faint stars were beginning to twinkle. There was one that glowed steadily. No one are on earth, Thurston stated softly. No one on earth. Maybe so, said the pilot. Maybe so. We've thought about it and talked about it, and they've gone ahead and done it. He called to a newsboy, and they took the latest additions to their room. The papers were ablaze with speculation. There were dispatches from all corners of the earth, interviews with scientists and near scientists. The machines were a Soviet invention. They were beyond anything human. They were harmless. They could wipe out civilization, poison gas, blasts of fire, like that of which had enveloped the enemy flyer. And through it all, Thurston read an ill-concealed fear, a reflection of panic that was gripping the nation. No, the whole world. These great machines were sinister. Wherever they appeared came the sense of being watched, of a, menace, of a menace being calmly withheld. And at the thought of obscene monsters inside those spheres, Thurston's lips were compressed and his eyes hardened. He threw the papers aside. They're here, and that's all we know. I hope the Secretary of War gets some good men together, and I hope someone's inspired with an answer. An answer, is it? I'm thinking that the answer will come, but not from these swivel chair fighters. It's the boys in the cockpits with one hand on the stick and one on their guns that'll have the answer. Thurston shook his head. Their speed and the gas. Remember that cold? How much of it could they lay over a city? The question was unanswered, unless the quick ringing of the phone was a reply. War Department, said a voice. Hold the wire. 
as the voice of the Secretary of War came on immediately. Thurston? Come over at once on the jump, old man. Things are happening. The windows of the War Department building were all alight as they approached. Cars were coming and going, men in uniform, as the Secretary had said, on the jump. Soldiers with bayonets stopped them, then passed Thurston and his companion on. Bells were ringing from all sides, but in the secretary's office, it was perfect quiet. General Lozier was there, Thurston saw, and an imposing array of gold-braided men with a sprinkling of those in civilian clothes. One he recognized, McGregor from the Bureau of Standards. The secretary handed Thurston some papers. Radio. They're all over the Pacific coast. Hit near Vancouver, Associated Press says city destroyed. They're working down the coast. Oh, excuse me. Same story. Blast of hydrogen from their funnel-shaped base. It was colder than Greenland below them. Snow fell in Seattle. No real attack since Vancouver and a little damage done. A message was laid before him. Portland. Five mystery ships over the city. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. <clears throat> Portland. Five mystery ships over the city. Dart repeatedly toward the earth, deliver a blast of gas, and then retreat. They're doing no damage. Apparently, they're inviting attack. All commercial planes were ordered grounded and were awaiting instructions. Gentlemen, I do believe I speak for all present when I say that in the absence of first-hand information, we're, un we're utterly unable to arrive at any definite conclusion or to make a definite plan. There's a menace in this, undeniably. Mr. Thurston and Mr. Riley have been good enough to report to me. They've seen one of the machines at close range. It was occupied by a monster so incredible that the report would receive no attention from me did I not know Mr. Thurston personally. Where have they come from? What does it mean? What is their mission? Gentlemen, I feel that I must see them. I want General Lozier to accompany me, also Dr. McGregor, to advise me from the scientific angle. I'm going to the Pacific Coast. Oh, good heavens. Apparently I'm feeling yawny today. <clears throat> I'm going to the Pacific Coast. They may not wait, that's true, that's true, but they appear to be going slowly south. I'll leave tonight for San Diego. I hope to intercept them. We have strong air forces there, and the Navy Department is cooperating. He waited for no comment. General... Will you kindly arrange for a plane? Take an escort or nod as you think best. Mr. Thurston and Mr. Riley will also accompany us. We want all the authoritative data we can get. This on my return will be placed before you, gentlemen, for your consideration. They rose from their chair. I hope they wait for us. Time was when a commander called loudly for a horse, but in this day a secretary of war is not kept waiting for a transportation. Sirening motorcycles preceded them from the city, and within an hour, motors roaring wide, propellers ripping into the summer night, lights slipping eastward 3,000 feet below, the Secretary of War for the United States was on their way. And on, a, and on either side from their plane stretched the arms of a V, like a flight of gigantic wild geese, fast-fighting planes of the Army Air Service bored steadily into the night, guarantors of safe convoy. The air service is ready, General Lozier had said. And Thurston and his pilot knew, that, knew from the east coast to the west swift scout planes whose idling engines could roar into action at a moment's notice stood waiting. Battle planes hidden in hangars would roll forth at the word. The Navy was cooperating. And at the San Diego, there were strong naval units, army units, and Marine Corps for that matter. They don't, they don't know what we can do, what we have up our sleeve... They're simply feeling us out, said the secretary. They'd stop more than once for gas and for wireless reports. He held a sheaf of typewritten. He held a sheaf of typewritten. Typewritten, rather. Good heavens. He held a sheaf of typewritten briefs. Sheaf of typewritten briefs. That's almost a tongue twister. <laughs> Going slowly south. They've taken their time. Hours over San Francisco in the Bay District. 
repeating same tactics, fall with terrific speed to cushion against their blast of gas. Trying to draw us out, provoke an attack, make us show our strength. Well, we'll beat them to San Diego at this rate. We'll be there in a few hours. I made a cup of tea before going on today and it tastes like a health store smells <laughs> if you know if you if you get the idea <laughs> you know you know how those health store has a very particular smell oh good heavens my phone how unpro how unprofessional I forgot to cancel that alarm <laughs> that was for something else Anyway, uh, returning to the story. <laughs> the afternoon sun was dropping ahead of them when they sighted the water. Echiner Pass, the pilot told them, where the Graf Zeppelin came through. Wonder what these birds would think of a Zepp. There's the ocean, he added after a time. San Diego glistened against the bare hills. There's North Island, the army field. He stared intently ahead, then shouted, And there they are. Look there. Over the city, a cluster of meteors was falling. Dark underneath, their tops shone like pure silver in the sun's slanting glare. They fell toward the city and then buried themselves in a dense cloud of steam, rebounding at once to the upper air, vapor trailing behind them. The cloud billowed slowly. It struck the hills of the city, then lifted and vanished. Land at once, requested the secretary. A flash of silver countermanded the order. It hung there before them, a great gleaming globe, keeping always its distance ahead. It was elongated at the base, Thurston observed. From that base shot, the familiar blast that termed steamy a hundred feet below as it chilled the warm air. There were round orifices like ports ranged around the top, where an occasional jet of vapor showed this to be a method of control. Other spots shone dark and glassy. Were they windows? He hardly realized their peril, so interested he was in the strange machine ahead. Then, Dodge that vapor, ordered General Lozier. The plane wavered and signaled to the others, and swung sharply to the left. Each man knew the flaming death that was theirs if the fire of their exhaust touched that explosive mixture of hydrogen and air. The great bubble turned with them and paralleled their course. He's, he's watching us, said Riley, giving us the once over, the slimy devil. Ain't there a gun on this ship? The general addressed his superior. Even above the roar of the motors, his voice seemed quiet, assured. We must not learn now. We can't land at North Island. It would focus their attention upon our defenses. That thing, whatever it is, is looking for a vulnerable spot. We must... Hold on, there he goes. The big bulb shot upward. It slanted above them and hovered there. I think he's about to attack. It's in your hands now, Captain. It's your fight. The Captain nodded and squinted above. He's got to throw heavier stuff than that, he remarked. A small object was falling from the cloud, and it passed close to their ship. <laughs> Half pint size, said Cyrus Thurston, and laughed in derision. There was something ludicrous in the futility of the attack. He stuck his head from a window into the gale they created. He sheltered his eyes to try to follow the missile in its fall. They were over the city. The crisscross of streets made a grill work of lines. Tall buildings were dwarfed from this 3,000 foot altitude. The sun slanted across a projecting promontory to make golden ripples on a blue sea, and the city sparkled back in the clear air. Tiny white faces were massed in the streets, huddled in clusters where the futile black missile had vanished. And then, the, and then the city was gone. A white cloud bank billowed and mushroomed. Slowly, it seemed to the watcher. So slowly. It was done in the fraction of a second. Yet in that brief time, his eyes registered the chaotic sweep of, in advance of the cloud. There came a crashing of buildings in some monster whirlwind, a white cloud engulfing it all. It was rising. It was on them. Good heavens. 
Why can't I move? Thought Thurston. The plane lifted and lurched. A thunder of sound crashed against them, an intolerable force. They were crushed to the floor as the plane was hurled over and upward. Out of the mad whirling tangle of flying bodies, Thurston glimpsed one clear picture. The face of the pilot hung battered and blood-covered before him, and over the limp body the hand of Slim Riley clutched at the switch. Holy boy, he's cutting the modus, he said dazedly, and the thought ended in blackness. There was no sound of engines or beating propellers when he came to his senses. Something lay heavy upon him, and he pushed it to one side. It was the body of General Lozier. He drew himself to his knees to look slowly about, rubbed stupidly at his eyes to quiet the whirl, and then stared at the blood on his hand. It was so quiet. The motors. What was it that had happened? Slim had reached for the switch, and the whirling subsided. Before him, he saw Slim Riley at the controls. He got to his feet and went unsteadily forward. It was a battered face that lifted to his. She was spinning. I brought her out. There's the field. His voice was thick. He formed the words slowly, painfully. I, I got a little land. Can you take it? I... I... He slumped limply in his seat. Thurston's arms were, not, were uninjured. He dragged the pilot to the floor and got back of the wheel. The field was below them and there were planes taxiing out. He heard the roar of their motors. He tried the controls and the plane answered stiffly, but he managed to level off as the brown field approached. Thurston never remembered that landing. He was trying to drag Riley from the battered plane when the first man got to him. Secretary of War, he gasped. In there, take Riley, I, I can walk. We'll get them, an officer assured him. Knew you were coming. They sure got you, but look at the city. Arms carried him stumbling from the field. Above the low hangars, he saw smoke clouds over the bay. These, these in red rolling flames marked what had, had been an American city. Far in the heavens moved five glinting specks. His head reeled with the thunder of engines. There were planes standing in lines and more erupting from hangars, where khaki-clad men, faces tensed under leather helmets, rushed swiftly about. General Lozier's dead, said a voice. Thurston turned to the man, and they were bringing the others. The rest are smashed up, son, but I think they'll pull through. The Secretary of War for the United States lay beside him. Men with red on their sleeves were slitting his coat. Through one good eye, he squinted at Thurston and managed to smile. Well, I wanted to see them up close. They say you saved us, old man. Thurston waved it aside. Thank Riley, he began, but the words ended in the roar of an exhaust. A plane darted swiftly to shoot vertically a hundred feet in the air. Another followed, and yet another. In a cloud of brown dust, they streamed endlessly out, zooming up like angry hornets, eager to get into the fight. Fast little devils, the ambulance man observed. Here come the big boys. Leviathan went deafeningly past, and again others came on in quick succession. Farther up the field, silvery gray planes with rudders flaunting their red, white, and blue rows to the circling heights. That's the Navy, was the explanation. The surgeon straightened the secretary's arm. See him come off the big airplane carriers. If his remarks were part of his professional training in removing a patient's thoughts from his pain, they were effective. The secretary stared out to sea, where two great flat-decked craft were shooting planes with the regularity of a rapid-fire gun. They stood out sharply against a bank of gray fog. Cyrus Thurston forgot his bruised body, forgot his own peril, even the inferno that raged back across the bay. He was lost in the sheer thrill of the spectacle. Above them, the sky was alive with winged shapes, and from all the disorder, there was order appearing. Squadron after squadron swept true battle formation. Like flights of wild ducks, the tr sh true sharp-pointed Vs soared off into the sky. Far above and beyond, rows of dots marked the race of swift scouts for the upper levels, and high in the clear air shone the glittering menace, trailing their five plumes of gas. 
A deeper detonation was merging into the uproar. It came from the ships, Thurston knew, where anti-aircraft guns poured a rain of shells into the sky. About the invaders, they bloomed into clusters of smoke balls. The globe shot a thousand feet into the air, and again the shells found them, and yet again they retreated. Look, they got one. He groaned as a long curving arc of speed showed that the big bulb was under control. Over the ships it paused to balance and swing, and then shot to the zenith as one of the great boats exploded in a cloud of vapor. The following blast swept the aerodrome. Planes yet on the ground went like dry autumn leaves. The hangars were flattened, and Thurston cowered in awe. They were sheltered, he saw, by a slope of the ground. No ridicule now for the bombs. A second blast followed when the glass cloud ignited. The billowing flames were dark blue. They writhed in tortured convulsions through the air, and in this explosions merged into one rumbling roar. McGregor had roused from his stupor, and he raised to a sitting position. Hydrogen, he stated positively, and pointed where great volumes of flame were, whirling, were sent whirling aloft. It burns as it mixes with air. The scientist was studying intently the mammoth reaction. But the volume, he marveled, the volume from that small container, impossible. Impossible, the secretary agreed, but with his, he pointed with his good arm toward the Pacific. Two great ships of steel, blackened and battered in that fiery breath, tossed helplessly upon the hitching, peeving, Pitching, heaving sea. Spoonerisms, everybody. <laughs> Two great ships of steel, blackened and battered in that fiery breath, tossed helplessly upon the pitching, heaving sea. They furnished to the scientist's exclamation the only adequate reply. Each man stared aghast to the pallid faces of his companions. I think we've underestimated the opposition, said the Secretary of War quietly. Look, the fog is coming in, but it's too late to save them. <coughs> oh. <clears throat> the big ships were vanishing in the oncoming fog. Whirls of vapor were eddying toward them in the flame blaster air. Above them, the watchers saw dimly the five gleaming bulbs. There were airplanes attacking. The tapping of machine gun fire came to them faintly. Fast planes circled and swooped toward the enemy. An armada of big planes dove in from beyond. Formations were blocking space above. Every branch of the service was there, Thurston exulted. The Army, Marine Corps, Navy. He gripped hard at the dry ground, in a paralysis of taut nerves. The battle was on, and in the balance hung the fate of the world. The fog drove in fast. Through straining eyes, he tried in vain to glimpse the drama spread above. The world grew dark and gray. He buried his face in his hands. And again came the thunder. The men on the ground forced their gaze to the clouds, though they knew some fresh horror awaited them. The fog clouds reflected the blue terror above. They were riven and torn, and, th and through them black objects were falling. Some blazed as they fell. They slipped into unthought maneuvers. They darted to earth, trailing yellow and black of gasoline fires. The air was filled with the dread, dread rain of death, that was spewed from the gray clouds. Gone was the roaring of motors. The Air Force of the San Diego area swept in silence to the earth, whose impact alone could give kindly concealment to their flame-stricken burden. Thurston's last control snapped, and he flung himself flat to bury his face in the sheltering earth. Only d the driving necessity of work to be done saved the sanity of the survivors. The commercial broadcasting stations were demolished, a part of the fuel for the terrible furnace across the bay. But the naval radio station was beyond an outlying hill, and the Secretary of War was in charge. 
An hour's work and this was again in commission to flash the world the story of disaster. It told the world also of what lay ahead. The writing was plain. No prophet was needed to forecast the doom and destruction that awaited the earth. Civilization was helpless. What of armies and cannon, of navies, of aircraft, when from some unreachable height these monsters within their bulbous machines could drop coldly, methodically, their diminutive bombs. And when each bomb meant shattering destruction, each explosion blasting all within a radius of miles, each followed by the blue blast of fire that melted the twisted framework of buildings and powdered the stones to make of a proud city a desolation of wreckage, black and silent beneath the cold stars. There was no crumb of comfort for the world in the terror, and the terror the radio told. <clears throat> Slim Riley was lying on an improvised cot when Thurston, the representative of the Bureau of Standards, joined him. Four walls of a room still gave shelter in a half-wrecked building. There were candles burning, and the dark was unbearable. Sit down, said McGregor quietly. We must think. Think? Thurston's voice had a hysterical note. I... Uh, I can't think. I, I mustn't think. I'm, I'll go raving crazy. Yes, think, said the scientist. Had it occurred to you that this is our only weapon left? We must think, we must analyze. Have these devils a vulnerable spot? Is there any known means of attack? We don't know. We must learn. Here in this room, we have all the direct information the world possesses of this menace. I've seen their machines in operation. You've seen more. You looked at the monsters themselves. At least one of them, anyway. The man's voice was quiet and methodical. Mr. McGregor was attacking a problem. Problems called for concentration, not hysterics. He could have poured the contents from a beaker without spilling a drop. His poise was needed. They were soon to make a laboratory experiment. The door burst open to admit a wild-eyed figure that snatched up their candles and dashed them to the floor. Lights out! There's one of them coming back! He was gone from the room after that screamed statement. The men sprang for the door, then turned to where Riley was clumsily crawling from his couch. An arm under each of his, and the three men stumbled from the room. They looked about them in the night. The fog banks were high, drifting in from the ocean, and beneath them the air was clear. From somewhere above, a hidden moon forced a pale light through the clouds. And over the ocean, close to the water, drifted a familiar shape. Familiar in its huge, sleek roundness, in its funnel-shaped base, where a soft roar made vaporous clouds upon the water. Familiar, too, in the wild dread it inspired. The watchers were spellbound. To Thurston there came a fury of impotent frenzy. It was so near. His hands trembled to tear at that door. To rip the foul mass he knew rip that foul mass that he knew was within a great bulb drifted past and it was nearing the shore but its action its motion gone was the certainty of control the thing settled and sank to rise weakly with a fresh blast of gas from its exhaust it settled again and passed waveringly on in the night thurston was struggling was hmm? Thurston was throbbing. There's not even an S in that sentence. Wow. Thurston was throbbingly alive with hope that was certainty. It, it's been hit. It's, it's been hit quickly. Someone after it. Follow it. He dashed for a car. There were some that had been salvaged from the less ruined buildings, and he swung it quickly around where the others were waiting. Got a gun. Hey, you, to an officer who had appeared. Your, your pistol, man, quick. We're going after it. He caught the tossed gun and hurried the others into the car. Wait, McGregor commanded. Would you hunt elephants with a pop gun or these things? Y yes, the other told him. Or my bare hands. Are you coming or you aren't you? The physicist was unmoved. The That creature you saw, you said it writhed in a bright light. You said it seemed almost in agony. There's an idea there. Yes, I'm going with you, but keep your shirt on and think. He turned again to the law. 
Oh. He turned again to the officer. We need lights, he explained. Bright lights, what is there? Magnesium? Lights of any kind? Wait. The man rushed off into the dark. He was back in a moment to thrust a pistol into the car. These are flares. Here's a flashlight if you need it. The car tore at the ground as Thurston opened it wide, and he drove recklessly toward the highway that followed the shore. The high fog had thinned to a mist. A full moon was breaking through to touch with silver the white, bra the white breakers hissing on the sand. It spread its full glory in dunes and sea, one of the more countless soft nights where peace and calm beauty told of an ageless, ageless existence that made naught of the red havoc or me of men or monsters. It shone on the ceaseless turf that had been beaten these shores before there were men, and it would thunder there still when there were men no more. But to the tense crouching men in the car, it shone only ahead on a distant glittering speck. A wavering reflection marked the uncertain flight of the stricken enemy. <clears throat> Thurston drove like a maniac. The road carried them straight toward their quarry. What would he do when he overtook it? He neither knew nor cared. There was only the blind fury forcing him on within reach of the thing. He cursed as lights of the car showed a bend in the road. It was leaving the shore. Excuse me. Sorry. He slackened their speed to drive cautiously into the sand. Oh, good heavens. I hope I don't get the hiccups. He slackened their speed to drive cautiously into the sand. It dragged at the car, but he fought through to the beach, where he hoped for firm footing. The tide was out. They tore madly along the smooth sand, breakers clutching at the flying wheels. The strange aircraft was nearer. It was plainly over the shore they saw. Thurston groaned as it shot high in the air in an effort to keep the clear of the cliffs ahead, but the heights were no longer a refuge. Again it settled, but it struck on the cliff to rebound in a last futile leap. The great pear shape tilted, then shot end over end, crashed hard on the firm sand. The lights of the car struck the wreck, and they saw the sphere, and they saw the shell roll over once. A ragged break was opening. The spherical tops fell slowly to one side. It was still rocking as they brought the car to a stop. Filling the lower shell they saw dimly was a mu mucus-like mass that seethed and struggled in the brilliance of their lights. McGregor was persisting his in his theory. Keep the lights on it. It can't stand the light. While they watched, the hideous bubbling beast oozed over the side of this broken shell that sheltered itself from the shadow beneath. And again, Thurston sensed the pulse and throb of life in this monstrous mass. He saw again in his rage the streaming rain of black airplanes. Saw, saw too, the bodies blackened and charred when they saw, as they saw them when first they tried rescue from the crashed ships where people, his people, men and women and little children had met terrible death. He sprang from the car and yet faltered with a revulsion that was almost a nausea. His gun was gripped in his hand as he ran toward the monster. Come back, shouted McGregor. Come back, have you gone mad? He was jerking at the door of the car. Beyond the white funnel of their lights, a yellow thing was moving. It twisted and flowed with incredible speed a hundred feet back to the base of the cliff, and it drew itself together in a quivering heap. An outthrusting rock threw a sheltering shadow. The moon was low in the west and the blackness as phosphorescence was apparent. It rippled and rose in the dark with a pulsing beat of the jelly-like mask. Mass. And through it there were showing two eyes, gray at first, but then they formed to black, staring eyes. Thurston had followed. His gun was raised as he neared it, and then out of the mask shot a serpentine arm. It whipped about him, soft, sticky, and viscid, utterly loathsome. He screamed once when it clung to his face, then tore savagely and in silence at the encircling folds. The gun, 
He ripped the blinding mask from his face and emptied the automatic in a stream of shots straight toward the eyes. And he knew as he fired that the effort was useless to, sh to have shot at the milky surf would have been as vain. The thing was pulling him irresistibly and he sank to his knees. It dragged him over the sand. He clutched at a rock and a vision was before him, the carcass of a steer half absorbed and still bleeding on the sand of an Arizona desert. To be drawn to the smothering embrace of the glutinous mass for that monstrous appetite, he tore afresh at the unyielding folds. Then knew McGregor was beside him. In the man's hand was a flashlight. The scientist risked his life on a guess. He thrust the powerful light in the clinging serpent, and it was like the touch of a hot iron to human flesh. The arms struggled and flailed in a paroxysm of pain. Paroxysm? Per paroxysm. A sudden attack or violent expression of particular emotion or activity. Thurston was free. He lay grasping on the stand. But McGregor, he looked up to see him vanish in the clinging ooze. Another thick tentacle had been projected from the main mass to sweep like a whip about the man. It hissed as it whirled about him in the still air. The flashlight was gone. Thurston's hand touched it in the sand. He sprang to his feet and pressed the switch, but no light responded. The flashlight was out, broken. A thick arm slashed and wrapped about him, beaten to the ground, and the wind was moving beneath him. He was being dragged swiftly, helplessly, toward what waited in the shadow. He was smothering. A blinding glare filled his eyes. <clears throat> On that note, I'm going to take a short break, grab some water, get a stretch in. I would suggest you all do the same. I'm going to run a little bumper while I'm out, and we'll pick up right where we left off. A Centra Credit Union wants to be your BFF, best financial friend. You've got enough on your mind during the school year, so we'll help make managing your college finances a little easier. Our freebie checking accounts will get your money right. You get a Visa debit card with no minimum balance or maintenance fees. And with over 5,000 shared branches nationwide, your Accentra membership lets you manage your money from anywhere. Perfect for college life. Accentra's My Mobile app lets you transfer funds, pay bills, and even deposit checks from your smartphone. And our Pop Money service lets you send and receive money from friends. No more hassling over the late night pizza bill. We can also help you pay for college. The Accentra Scholarship Program awards $10,000 in scholarships every year or take advantage of our private student loans. Either way, we've got your back. Become a member owner today. Hashtag like a boss. Details at Accenture.org. Listening, caring, doing what's right. We are Accenture Credit Union. All right. Let me just get one last drink of tea in, and then we will continue. <clears throat> the fire, the flares were still burning when he dared look about. McGregor was pulling frantically at his arm. Quick, quick, he was shouting. Thurston scrambled to his feet, and one glimpse he caught of a heaving yellow mass in the, in the white light. It twisted in horrible convulsions. They ran stumblingly, drunkenly, toward the car. Riley was half out of the machine. He'd tried to drag himself to their assistance. I couldn't make it, he thought, and then I thought of the flares. Thank heaven said McGregor with emphasis. It was your legs that, par that were paralyzed, Riley, not your brain. Thurston found his voice. Let me have that very pistol. If light hurts the thing, I'm going to put a blaze of magnesium in the middle of it if I die for it. They're all gone. Then let's get out of here. I've had enough. We can come back later on. He got back of the wheel and slammed the door of the sedan. The moonlight was gone and the darkness, that was, the darkness was velvet, just tinged with the gray that precedes the dawn. Back in the deeper blackness of the cliff base, a phosphorescent something wavered and glowed. The light rippled and flowed in all directions over the mass. Thurston felt vaguely its mystery. The bulk was a vast, naked brain, its quiverings like visible thought waves. 
The phosphorescence grew brighter. The thing was approaching. Thurston let in his clutch, but the scientist checked him. Wait, wait! I wouldn't miss this for the world. He waved toward the east, where far distant ranges were etched in palest rows. We, lo we know less than nothing of these creatures, in what part of the universe they're spawned, how they live, where they live, Saturn, Mars, the moon, but we shall, too, we shall soon know how one dies. The thing was coming from the cliff. In the dim grayness it seemed less yellow, less fluid. A membrane enclosed it. It was close to the car. Was it hunger that drove it, or cold rage for these puny opponents? Its hollow eyes were glaring. A thick arm formed quickly to dart out, of the, dart out toward the car. A cloud high above caught the color of approaching day. Before their eyes, the vile mass pulsed visibly. It quivered and beat. Then, sensing its danger, it darted like some headless serpent for its machine. It massed itself about the shattered top to heave convulsively. The top was lifted, carried toward the rest of the great metal egg. The sun's first rays made golden arrows through the distant peaks. The struggling mass released its burden to stretch its vile length toward the dark caves under the cliffs. The last sheltering fog veil parted, and the thing was halfway to the high bank when the first sh bright shaft of direct sunlight shot through. Incredible in the concealment of night, the vast protoplasmic pod was doubly so in the glare of day. But it was there before them, not a hundred feet distant and it boiled in vast, tortured convulsions. The clean sunshine struck it, and the mass heaved itself into the air, a nauseous eruption, and then fell limply to the earth. The yellow membrane turned paler. Once more, the staring black eyes formed to turn hopelessly toward the sheltering globe, and then the bulk flattened out on the sand. It was a jelly-like mound, through which trembled endless, quivering palpitations. The sun struck hot, and before the eyes of the watching, speechless men was a sickening, horrible sight, a festering mass of corruption. The sickening, the sickening yellow was liquid. It seethed and bubbled with liberated gases. It decomposed to purplish fluid, fluid streams. A breath of wind blew in their direction, and the stench from the hideous pool was overpowering, unbearable. Their heads swam in the evil breath. Thurston ripped his gears into reverse, and didn't stop until they were far away on the clean sand. The tide was coming in when they returned. Gone was the vile putrescence. The waves were lapping at the base of the gleaming machine. We'll have to work fast, said McGregor. I must know, I must learn. He drew himself up and onto the shattered shell. It was made of a metal, and it was some forty feet across, its framework a maze of lattice struts. The central part was clear. Here in a wide, shallow pan, the monster had rested. Below this was tubing, intricate coils, massive, heavy, and strong. McGregor lowered himself upon it, and Thurston was beside him. They went down into the dim bowels of the deadly instrument. Hydrogen. Hydrogen, there's our starting point. A generator, obviously, forming the gas from what? They couldn't compress it. They couldn't carry or make it. Not the volume they evolved, but they did it. They, they did it. Gotta say, today the the THOs today not very good. <clears throat> Would not drink again. <laughs> Close to the coils, a dim light was glowing. It was a pinpoint of radiance in the half darkness about them, and the two men bent closer. See, it strikes on this mirror, bright metal and parabolic. It disperses the light, doesn't concentrate it. Here's another, and and another. This one's bent, mm, broken. They're adjustable. Mm. Micrometer accuracy for reducing the light. The last one could reflect through the slot. It's light that does it, Thurston. It's light! D does what? Thurston had followed the other's analysis of the diffusion process, but he seemed to have missed something. The light that would reach that slot would be hardly perceptible. It's the agent, the activator, the catalyst! What is it strike upon? I must know, I must! The waves were splashing outside the shell, and Thurston turned in a feverish search of the unexplored depths. Depths. Ah, oh, depths. Jeez, I don't know why I can't say depths today. Thurston turned in a fe feverish search of the unexplored depths. There was a surprising simplicity, an absence of complicated mechanism. The generator, with its tremendous braces to carry its thrust to the framework itself, filled most of the space. 
Some of the ribs were thicker, he noticed. Solid metal, as if they might carry great weights. Resting upon them were ranged numbers of objects. They were like eggs, slender and inches in length. On some were propellers. They worked through the shells on long, slender rods. Each was threaded finely. An adjustable arm engaged the thread. Thurston called excitedly to the other. He here they are. Look, here are the shells. Here's what blew us up. He pointed to the slim shafts with their little propeller-like fans. Adjustable, see? Unwind in their fall, set them for any length of travel. And fires the charge in the air. That's how they wiped out our air fleet. There were others without propellers. They had fins to hold them nose downward. On each nose was a small rounded cap. Detonators of some sort. We've got to have one. We must get it out quick. The tide's coming in. He laid his hands upon one of the slim egg-shaped thing, egg things. He lifted and then strained mightily. But the object didn't rise. It only rolled sluggishly. Hmm. The scientist stared at it amazed. Sp specific gravity? Uh, beyond anything known? There's nothing on Earth. No such substance, no form of matter. His eyes were incredulous. Well, there's lots to learn, Thurston answered grimly. We've yet to learn of how to fight off the other four. Here's the secret. These shells liberate the same gas that drives the machine. Solve one and we solve both. Then we learn how to combat it. But how to remove it, that's the problem. You and I could never lift this out of here. His glance darted about. There was a small door in the metal beam. The groove in which the shells were placed led to it. It was a port for launching their projectiles. He moved it and opened it. A dash of spray struck him in the face, and he glanced inquiringly at his companion. Dare we do it? Slide one of them out? Each man looked long into the eyes of the other. Was this then the end of their terrible night? One shell to be dropped, then a bursting volcano to blast them to eternity? The boys in their planes risk it, and they got theirs. He stopped for a broken fragment of steel. Try one with a fan on. It hasn't got a detonator. The men pried at the slim thing, and it slid slowly toward the open port. One heave and it balanced on the edge, and then vanished abruptly. The spray was cold on their faces, and they breathed heavily with the realization that they still lived. He there were days of horror that followed, horror tempered by a numbing paralysis of all emotions. There were bodies by the thousands to be heaped in the pit where San Diego had stood, to be buried beneath countless tons of debris and dirt. Trains brought an army of helpers. Aeroplanes came with doctors and nurses in the beginning of a mountain of supplies. The need was there. It must be met. Yet the whole world was waiting while it helped, waiting for the next blow to fall. Telegraph service was improvised, and radio receivers rushed in. The news of the world was theirs once more, and it told of a terrified, waiting world. There would be no temporizing now on par... There would be no temporizing now on the part of the invaders. They'd seen the airplanes swarming from the ground. They knew an aerodrome next time from the air. They would know an aerodrome next time from the air. Thurston had noted the windows in the great shell, windows of dull colored glass, which would protect the darkness of the interior, essential to life for the horrible occupant, but through which it could see. It could watch all directions at once. At once, rather. The great shell had vanished from the shore, and pounding waves in the shifting sands of the high, st high tide had obliterated all trace. More than once had Thurston uttered devout thanks for the chance shell from an anti-aircraft gun that entered the funnel beneath the machine, had bent and twisted the arrangement of mirrors that he and McGregor had seen, and exploding, had cracked and broken the domed roof of the bulb. They had learned little, but McGregor was up north within reach of Los Angeles labor laboratories. And he had with him the slim cylinder of death. He was studying, thinking. Telephone service had been established for official business. The whole nationwide system, for that matter, was under military control. The Secretary of War had flown back to Washington, and the whole world was on a war basis. War. And none knew where they should defend themselves, nor how. An orderly rushed Thurston to the telephone. You are wanted at once. Los Angeles calling. The voice of McGregor was cool and unhurried as Thurston listened. Grab a plane. Come up here on the jump. 
The phrase brought a grim smile to Thurston's tiled lips. Tired lips. Tiled lips. Yes, lips that are covered in tiles. They're, very, they're that dry. The phrase brought a grim smile to Thurston's tired lips. Did McGregor have something? Was a different kind of help preparing to pop? The thoughts flashed through the listener's mind. I need a good deputy. You may be the whole works, you may have to carry on, but I'll tell you it all later. Meet me at the Biltmore. In less than two hours, Thurston assured him. A plane was at his, was at his disposal. Riley's legs were functioning again after a fashion. They kept the appointment with minutes to spare. Come on, come on, I'll walk you to the car. Or come on, I'll walk you to my car. The automobile whirled them out of the city to race off upon a winding highway that climbed in the far hills. There were twenty miles of this. McGregor had time for his talk. They've struck. They were over Germany yesterday. The news was kept quiet. I got the report a half hour ago. They pretty well wiped out Berlin. No air force there. France and England sent a swarm of planes from the reports. Poor devils. No need to tell you what they got. We've seen it firsthand. They headed west over the Atlantic, the four machines. Gave English to bur gave England a burst or two, paused over New York, and then went on. But they're here somewhere, we think. Now listen, how was it from the time... How long was it from the time when you first saw the monster until we heard from them again? Thurston forced his mind back to those days that seemed so far in the past, and he tried to remember. Four days. It was the fourth day after we found the devil feeding. Feeding? That's the point I'm making. Four days. Remember that. And we knew they were down in the Argentine five days ago. That's another item kept from a hysterical public. They slaughtered some thousands of cattle. There were scores of them where the, found where the devils, I'll borrow Riley's word, where the devils had fed. Nothing but left but hide and bones. And mark this, that was four days before they appeared over Berlin. Why? Don't ask me. Do they have to lie quiet for that amount of time? Up there in space? Only heaven knows. Perhaps. These things... Seem outside the knowledge of a deity. But enough of that. Remember, four days. Let us assume that there's a four day waiting period. It'll help us to time them. I'll come back to that later. Here's what I've been doing. We know that light, the light is a means of attack. <clears throat> we know that light is a means of attack. I believe that the detonators we saw in those bombs merely opened a seal in the shell and forced in a flash of some sort. I believe that the radiant energy is what fires the blast. What is it that explodes? Nobody knows. We've opened the shell, working in the absolute blackness of a room a hundred feet underground. We found in a powder. Two powders, to be exact. They're mixed. One's finely divided, the other rather granular. Their specific gravity is enormous, beyond anything known to physical scientists. Physical science, unless it would be the hypothetical neutron masses we think are in certain stars. But this isn't matter as we know matter. It's something new. Our theory is this. The hydrogen atom has been split, resolved into components, not of electrons in the proton centers, but held at some halfway point of decomposition. Matter composed only of neutrons would be heavy beyond belief. This fits the theory in that respect. But the point is this. When these solids are formed, they're dense. They represent in a cubic centimeter, probably a cubic, possibly a cubic mile of hydrogen gas under normal pressure. That's a guess, but it'll give you the idea. Not compressed, you understand, but all the elements present in other, than, in other than elemental form for the reconstruction of the atom for a million billions of atoms. To be fair, that does kind of hold up now. I mean, an atom's mostly empty space, isn't it? <laughs> then the light strikes it. These dense solids become instantly a gas, miles of it held in that small space. There you have it. The gas, the explosion, the entire absence of heat which is to say it's terrific cold when it expands. Slim Riley was looking bewildered, but game. Well, sure, I saw it snow, so I guess the rest must be okay, but what are you going to do about it? You say light kills them and fires the bombs, but how can we let light in them big steel shells or the little ones either? Well, not through those thick walls. Not light. One of our anti-aircraft shells made a direct hit. That might not happen in a million shots. But there are other forms of radiant energy that do penetrate steel. The car had stopped behind a grove of eucalyptus. Eucalyptus. 
The, star, the car had stopped beside a grove of, u, grove of eucalypt... Dang. The sentence kicking my butt. <clears throat> the car had stopped beside a grove of eucalyptus. A barren, sun-baked hillside stretched beyond, and McGregor motioned them to a light. Riley was afire with optimism. And do you believe it? Do you believe we got him licked? Thurston, too, looked into McGregor's face. Riley wasn't the only one who needed encouragement, but the gray eyes were suddenly tired and hopeless. You ask what I believe. I believe we're witnessing the end of, a, of the world, of our world of humans, their struggles, happiness, their grave hopes, and aspirations. He wasn't looking at them. His gaze was far off in space. Men will struggle and fight with their puny weapons, but these monsters will win, and they'll have their way with us. Then more of them will come. The world, I believe, is doomed. He straightened his shoulders. But we can die fighting, he added and pointed over the hill. Over there in the valley beyond is a charge of explosive, of their explosive, and a little apparatus of mine. I intend to fire the charge from a distance of three hundred yards. I expect it to be safe, perfectly safe, but accidents happen. In Washington, a plane is being prepared. I've given instructions through hours of phoning. They're working night and day. It'll contain a huge generator for producing my ray. Nothing new, just the product of our knowledge of radiant energy up to date. <clears throat> but the man who flies that plane will die horribly. No time to experiment with protection. The rays will destroy him, though he may live a month. I'm asking you to handle that plane, he told Cyrus Thurston. You may be of service to the world. You may find you're utterly powerless. You'll surely die. But you know the machines and the monsters. Your knowledge may be of value in an attack. He waited, and the silence hung in the air for a heavy moment. Why, sure, said Cyrus Thurston. <clears throat> he looked at the eucalyptus grove with earnest appraisal. The sun made lovely shadows among their stripped trunks. The world was a beautiful place. A lingering death, McGregor had animated, and horrible. Why, sure, he repeated s steadily. Sam R Slim Riley shoved him firmly aside to face to face McGregor. Cheer hell, I'm your man, McGregor. What do you know about flying? He asked Cyrus Thurston. You're good for a beginner, but men like you two have got brains. I'm thinking the world would be needing them. Now all I'm good for is holding a stick. His brogue had returned to his speech and was evidence evidence of his earnestness. And besides. The smile faded from his lips, and his voice was suddenly soft. Them boys we saw take that last slip was just pilots to you. Just a bunch of good fighters. Well, they're buddies of mine. I fought beside some of them in France. I belong. Besides, he grinned at Thurston. What do you know about dogfights, anyway? McGregor gripped him by the hand. You win. Report to Washington. The secretary has all the dope. He turned to Thurston. Now for you. Get this. The enemy machines almost attacked New York. One of them came low and then went back, and the four flashed out of sight toward the west. It's my belief that New York is next, but the devils are hungry. The beast that attacked us was ravenous, remember? They need food and lots of it. You hear their feeding, and you can count on four days. Keep Riley informed. That's your job. Now I'm going over the hill. If this experiment works, there's a chance we can repeat it on a larger scale. No certainty, but a chance. I'll be back. Full instructions at the hotel in case. He vanished into the scrub growth. Well, that's not exactly encouraging, but he's a good man, Mac. A good, ma a good egg. Not as big a brain as the one we saw, but perhaps it's a better one. Cleaner and it's working. They were sheltered under the brow of the hill but the blast from the valley beyond rocked them like an earthquake. They rushed to the top of the knoll where McGregor was standing in the valley. He waved them a greeting and shouted something unintelligible. The gas had mushroomed in a cloud of steamy vapor, and from above came snowflakes to whirl in the churning mass and then fall to the ground. 
A wind came howling about them to beat back upon the plot. A wind came howling back about them to beat upon the cloud. It swirled slowly back and down the valley, and the figure of McGregor vanished in its smothering embrace. Exit, McGregor," said Cyrus Thurston softly. He held tight to the struggling figure of Slim Riley. He, he couldn't live a minute in that as atmosphere of hydrogen. They can, the devils, but not a good egg like Mac. It's our job now, yours and mine. Slowly the gas retreated and tried to permit their passage down the slope. <sighs> McGregor was a good prophet. Thurston admitted that when four days later, Thurston admitted that when four days later he stood on the roof of the Equitable Building in Lower New York, the monsters had fed. Had fed the, the, the monsters had fed as predicted. Out in Wyoming, a desolate area marked the place of their meal, where a great herd of cattle lay smothered and frozen. There were ranch houses too in the circle of destruction. Their occupants frozen stiff as the carcasses that dotted the plains. Only Thurston had lived in the certainty of a few days' reprieve, and now had come the fourth day. In Washington was Riley. Thurston had been in touch with him frequently. Sure, it's a crazy machine, the pilot had told him, and it's not much, and it, and it's not much to think of at all. Neither bullets nor guns, just this big glass contraption and speed. She's fast, man, she's fast, but it's a little hope I have. And Thurston, remembering the scientist's words, was heartless and sick with dreadful certainty. There were aircraft ready near New York. It was generally felt that there was the next objective. The enemy had looked it over carefully, and Washington, too, was guarded. The nation's capital must receive what little help the aircraft could afford. There were other cities waiting for destruction. If not this time, then later. The horror hung over them all. All right, well... <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, I'm still fighting off that cold, and my throat, <clears throat> my voice, I should say, is not holding up as long as I was expecting it to. I was hoping to do an hour and a half, two hour show today, but this is about as far as I can go, so we're going to have to leave on that cliffhanger. Next week, uh, I really genuinely hope my voice will be back by then. If it's not, I will honestly have to go see some kind of a doctor but I'm, I think I'm coming off of this cold anyway but it's my voice isn't 100% so we're gonna have to leave off on that cliffhanger we're gonna find out whether Riley is successful in his assault next week thanks for tuning in everybody if you uh, if you missed any part of the show the video for this should go up tomorrow on my YouTube channel uh, if you search Glacier Nester it should be there um, what else? Oh, if you've if you've missed uh, any of the previous week's shows, you can definitely give them a look there. I've also got other content there, but I can't exactly promote that. It's not really related. <laughs> it's good, though, in my opinion. Has been, especially so lately. But regardless of all that, uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Sorry it was a short show this week. But hey... At least we got some paper cuts in, you know? <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Here's some music. <laughs>